We're now entering the second session with regard to discernment, this time discerning God's will, with the guidelines again coming from St. Ignatius's spiritual exercises. Before we move into that, I'd like to just say, uh, to step back and say a, a, a little bit about why we're, in, we're engaging in this whole question of seeking help uh, relating to certain kinds of feelings. Uh, we'll see as I enter into the discerning God's will process that one important stage can be making use of certain feelings to help us find out what God wants us to do in terms of specific courses of action we're invited to consider. Uh, and so that's, that's the most immediate uh, significance of the guidelines for discerning God's spirits is to help us when we're being given feelings as evidence to use them well to make good decisions. Uh, but secondly, uh, life in organizations and life in our families and life on the job is full of all kinds of cross currents. And the cross currents come from other people and how they speak to us, their tone of voice, what their values are, and what our values are, and what, what our uh, buttons are. What our, but we're like lute, a lute, each of us like a lute with strings that come from our childhood and from growing up, and people pluck, can pluck our strings. And if we don't notice our strings and notice how we're being plucked, we can just react instead of respond. In the spiritual exercises, making choices is utterly central. When we're in the second week of the exercises, we're watching Jesus make choices. After we've noticed God, the Trinity, making the choice for one of the Trinity to become human. But then as Jesus grows, he's making choices in a variety of situations, and we're meant to contemplate Jesus making those choices and with the help of the Holy Spirit become what we're contemplating. Not replicas of Jesus, but learning how to choose in the spirit of Jesus or under the guidance of the, of the Holy Spirit. And this culminates in the election in the second week of the exercises, which for me is a deep choice making under the power of the Holy Spirit that's the fruit of our being conformed to Jesus through those contemplative experiences of the second week. That's, that's just one example. The, 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 uh, the choice making goes from principle and foundation to the contemplatio. But, but uh, making choices is for Ignatius, who is in a sense a very modern individual in this respect, is at the center of, of being a human being. Uh, he understands freedom as the power we have to determine who will be in relationship to others, under grace, with the help of grace. But freedom as self-determination, not simply freedom of choice, apples, oranges, you know, Wheaties or Rice Krispies. No, through our choices of relationships with people and use of objects, remember the principle and foundation, through, through those choices, we're fashioning ourselves on, uh, with God's help to become eternally a someone in relationship to others. So we're, we're getting now into the heart of the exercise, but also heart of, the, of human living, of ma making choices where it all comes together. And Ignatius takes this very seriously. So we're going to be looking at Christian decision-making now, or discerning, seeking God's will, and seeking to, uh, and trying, and wanting to carry it out once we know what it is. I'd like to begin with six initial considerations that, that I will build on. First of all, discerning God's will, using the processes that we're going to look at in a, in a few moments, is all about seeking to learn how God wants me to use my freedom right here and now. Right here and now. How does God want me to use my freedom? There is no prediction involved in a successful discerning of God's will. I can discern that God wants me to uh, marry a certain, to ask a certain person to marry, to marry me. Got to be careful about how you frame this. Uh, but the person might 
leave town permanently and be, go beyond my world and my life, and I don't have a chance to ask this person, will you marry me? This is a crazy example, but that doesn't invalidate the discernment. If one did it well in the here and now, it was, unless there's an impediment or a change, you are to continue on that course, unless we have new data for new discernment, but it's not predicting that it will work out. Now, success and failure can be important in our lives and in the business world and our personal lives, but actually, success and failure in, in, in discerning God's will and living it is not exactly the same. Uh, think of Jesus on the cross. We, what we count as success and what God wants us to become and do in the world for the sake of God's reign can be really different. That's one of the, one of the, the important aspects of this in terms of our faith. So no prediction in discerning God's will, but we are indeed in call to ask God, help me to know how right now and here and now I am to be doing your will. Secondly, I cannot discern for someone else in their freedom. So if I ask, does God want me to marry this person? That other person has a say in the matter. Does God want me to ask this person to marry me? No, that's a properly framed object of the sermon. When I was in high school and college, did God want me to become a Jesuit? was not the question that I should be asking, but I was, and nobody corrected me. Uh, I couldn't discern all on my own whether, whether or not God wanted me to become a Jesuit. I could discern, does God want me to do all in my power to apply to the Society of Jesus? And then wait on the provincial's discernment, the executive discernment, as distinct from my consultative discernment, to admit me or not. That's really, I think, very important clarity for us to have, that if I'm in an agreed upon relationship, and I'm not calling it into question, where someone else has the executive power of decision, and I'm invited to inform that executive decision by what God wants me to bring to that other person, then, I'm, then, then I have a, a right order in the process. And there, there won't be contradiction if, if, the, if the superior or if the boss of makes a decision that uh, is, uh, is different from the reasons I brought forward, you know, under grace to, to help inform his choice making. So thirdly, because Christian decision making is about how God wants me to use my freedom in the here and now, the non-occurrence of what's decided doesn't invalidate the previous discernment. I might get sick, uh, and so ca can't carry out the, what I decided to do. Or the future changes, like other factors come into play I know nothing about, and I couldn't possibly know about, that may, may mean I have to go back to the drawing board and do fresh discernment. That's all part of the, the ongoing process of discernment. So, the non-occurrence does not mean that I failed as a discerner. I may be disappointed for other reasons. Fine, that's human. But God's at work on, in God's way in the situation. It's different from the, the little flashlight I have in trying to, to see into the, to the future. Fourthly, discerning God's will is conditioned by, first of all, the quality of my self-presence, my ability to, as I mentioned in the first session, be present to, to witness the interior things going on in me, the inner movements, and the spirits behind the movements. But it's also dependent, the quality of my discerning is also dependent on my knowledge of the context of my decision-making, which homework will give me to some degree, but it'll be imperfect. There's a lot about the context I'm not going to know about right away. Uh, 